you know, well-connected guy in, in Denver uh, that's been working on this project with Clint Jones since they've started down this kind of new path. Um, so I don't, I don't know the answer to your question. And the four source process is a really interesting one for the access. Um, and I don't want to spend too much time here, but because really where Clint's going now is, is in a different direction with this land exchange proposal. I think we should talk a lot about that. But, um, but it's important to recognize that uh, Clint keeps saying, you know, we can always go back to the old plan. We can always go back to the old access process. We'll do our EIS. Uh, we'll get access. And we'll do the old plan. Uh, that's, he's been really dishonest uh, when he says that. And I, want, and I think it's important for everyone to understand that. Because he's trying to say you can have the old plan or you can have a new plan. Um, that's, that's not true. The old plan can never happen, and I'll tell you why. Um, for, they could go back to the Forest Service and request uh, access. That's absolutely true, and they would likely get authorization of some sort of access. The Forest Service is required to grant access sufficient for reasonable use and enjoyment of a piece of private land. I'm sure you guys deal with this all the time within homes. Uh, what, it, what is reasonable use and enjoyment has been interpreted very differently from one place to the next by the Forest Service, by different courts. It's an open question. So we don't know what McCombs would get if he went back through that process, but he'd get something. It might be a horse trail, it might be a six-lane highway, um, but he'd get something. Whether or not it would be sufficient to build their village, well, we won't know unless they go down that road. Uh, even if they got a six-lane highway to their project. They couldn't build the old plan, though, because a year ago, when they settled the lawsuit with Wolf Creek Ski Area, the developer and, and the ski area have been suing each other over contract disputes that went back um, quite some time. I don't know the, none of us know the entire outcome of that lawsuit, but one piece that came out of the settlement of that lawsuit was a bunch of new easements that were recorded on the property uh, last summer. Uh, basically taking, for those of you that have skied up at Wolf Creek Ski Area, uh, Mr. McCombs owns a bunch of the property right above, on the hill right above the base of the Alberta lift. Uh, it's kind of, there's a bunch of ski runs that go through it. People, you know, it's part of the ski area for all intents and purposes. And they reserved that entire area for skiing. There's no housing to be authorized there. The original land use plan. Excuse me, but is that the top or at the not bottom? Not the bottom. Okay. But like the first couple hundred feet above the above the base of the upper now I'm with you. Um, cross country country. Yeah, it's kind of the flat terrain that y'all that we all glide through on our way back to the base of the lift. Um, or it's flat, relatively flat compared to the, the upper part of the mountain. All that in the original land use plan was was dense townhome development. <coughs> or over six hundred units um, on that portion of the property that's no longer a, a, a possible for development. So the the old land use plan can't work. It's outdated. It doesn't match uh, an agreement that McCombs signed off on when they settled their lawsuit. So how many so, acres does that easement encompass of what they have? It's about 100 acres. <coughs> um, they own, currently, they own about 287 and a half acres because they sold actual lift alignments to the ski area uh, back in the 90s. So Mr. McCombs owns 287 and a half. Uh, but then there's easements, both ski easements as well as utility easements and various things that the ski area needed to be able to continue to operate their business um, that occupy about 100 acres. There's also about 70 acres of wetlands. Um, so you start with 287, you take off 100 for easements, you take off 70 for wetlands, and you're left with about 100 acres to work with. Um, I'm sure there's cities of 10,000 people built on 100 acres, but it gets a little tricky. Are these easements across 100 acres? Or, I mean, I can't imagine the entire 100 acres being taken up by an easement. Yeah, they are. Because that's a ski area. And it's basically saying, um, McCombs owns the property, but he can't build anything here that prohibits it from being a ski area. There are areas reserved for skiing. There's no building permitted there. Um, there's other linear easements that are for utilities and things like that that are underground. Okay. Uh, so we're left with a, you know, we can't go back to the old plan. They could go back to the old process. Um, go through the Forest Service access process, get some sort of access, build a new development plan based on whatever kind of access they get and whatever property they've got left. But the old plan's off the table. So that kind of sets us up for where do we go from here. Um, I want to answer your question first. But, but. I think what you're trying to say 
is that if the EIS process, which is a federal process, is done correctly, yeah. they may or may not be able to build something up there. They may or may not be able to build something that they, they may or may not be able to build what they've proposed today. Right. And I, I think a little historical note is in 1986, when this original deal happened, Reagan was the president. Correct. In 1986, I worked for HUD, and we were under a extreme pressure to approve a deal in Utah which the staff didn't want to approve and the regional administrator kept having meetings but nobody had the courage to override the GS 13s and 12s that were in charge of and actually an EIS and some other stuff yeah so <clears throat> I can see why the original trade took place sure then on in 1999 Clinton was the president and in 2000, from 2000 to 2008, well, 2001 to 2008, we were dealing with a different administration. Yeah. But I think what you're trying to say again is they didn't go through the proper EIS. And if you do the environmental impact, then you know what you actually could do. Exactly. And you can take steps to fix the problems. You know, if you say, hey, this is going to create a huge burden on. Archuleta County for providing housing and schooling children that are going to work at this facility and um, providing social services for these families that are not particularly high paying jobs. Um, then, you know, if you identify that as a problem in an EIS process, you can try to fix it. And you can say, okay, Mr. McCombs, we need a revenue stream to come to Archuleta County to deal with these problems, to provide for schooling for these kids, to provide um, you know, uh, other social services. But if you don't know what the problems are up front, it's really hard to negotiate a solution to them. Uh, 